welcome to Sports Econ 101. And for those of you listening to our show for the first time, imagine a few guys sitting around a bar having drinks without the drinks, talking business and sports with you, the audience, listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, well-known sports radio personality, Bruce McGowan, and Vern Glenn of CBS affiliate KPIX-TV in San Francisco. And on this show, we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. In addition, we'll ask sports trivia questions, where we're giving away vacations to the first three callers with the correct answer. Our phone number is 888-660-4495. Now write that number down, 888-660-4495, because you're going to use that number to answer the trivia question for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. And the vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by Lighthouse Resort and Marina, located one hour northeast of San Francisco. The vacations are free. Their only request, a $75 house cleaning fee uh, to cover those expenses. And their website is lighthouse4fun.com. And today's trivia theme is sports in the movies. And today's guest also is going to be Ron Barr, who is the main guy at Sports Byline USA. And he has been a major sports radio uh, personality for a number of years. Uh, we're going to also on the show. We're going to talk about renegotiating contracts, uh, the all-star ballots. Uh, you know where does Yasiel Puig come in? Uh, comparison of baseball fields making home runs easier in some parks versus others. Uh, the 31 cars at Daytona that failed inspection for illegal roof flaps. The uh, antitrust being tested again. The A's wanting to move to San Jose. And this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by IRA Services Trust Company, providing self-directed retirement accounts with more choices, diversification, and among the lowest fees in the industry. I personally use them to hold my diversified IRA. You need to check them out because they have the best prices at iraservices.com. And don't touch that dial because you're listening to Sports Econ 101, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn of CBS affiliate KPIX TV in San Francisco. Hello! Hey, Bruce McGowan is uh, off today, uh, but we do have a special guest on the phone. We have Ron Barr, who is the veteran journalist and sports broadcaster who launched Sports Byline USA, America's largest sports talk radio network. Ron, welcome to Sports Econ 101. Well, thank you very much. And Vern, you've uh, been around for a while, and I've been around. Anytime anybody refers to us as veteran, it makes me sound like we're about to die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm right with you there, but uh, hey, you know, hey, not, not blowing smoke, but boy, yeah, you, you build a Mount Rushmore of, of, of those who have launched uh, uh, these types of, of shows, and uh, you're you're up there alone, brother. Well, I thank you for those comments, and you know, as we celebrate our 25th anniversary as the first sports talk radio network in the country, it has not been done, uh, you know, I had a lot of good people involved with me, and one of the things I've always known, uh, Edward and Vern, is that I know what I don't know, and I listen to those that do. There you go. So the influences in my life, because uh, I knew nothing about business, and I will just honestly tell you, and Vern, since we're both in uh, in the San Francisco market, when I was doing a local show, I had uh, Duke Snyder in, and a guy called the show one night, he said, Ron, I've waited 35 years to talk to Duke Snyder, and tonight you're giving me the chance. And that was the seed for the idea about a national sports talk radio network, and my broadcasting partner on television was Billy Jean King, and so we were doing an event, and I said, Billy Jean, I've got this idea about doing a national sports talk radio network, but I don't know anything about business. And she looked me in the eye, and she said something I'll never forget. And she said, I think I know you well enough, Ron. You never want to look over your shoulder and wonder if you could have. And that was the seed for it. Uh, and we launched on October 24, 1988, with 12 radio stations across the country. I didn't know that we were only two hours a night, Monday through Friday, and I didn't know whether anybody would call or not. But I did know I could interview. And my first guest, first night, first hour, who flew in from Reno because he was doing an appearance up there and then flew back, and we're not good friends, was the great Willie Mays. Wow. That's great. Well, what, what, probably the only time he's ever been in a leadoff position. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a good point. But after that first hour, Vern, uh, 
I walked into the door and I said, Willie, I said, why did you go to such an effort? Because as I said, we were not good friends. He said, I like the way you treat people, and I want to be able to look back someday and say I played a part. There you go. That's what a story. Good, good guy. Okay. Yeah, and you know, so that was where we launched from, and then my limited partnership group uh, you'll have an appreciation for because it is Billie Jean King. It is Eddie DeBarbolo, it is Brian Billick, it is uh, Donald Foyle, it is Lee Steinberg, it is Darren Nelson, and all of these guys are limited partners, uh, but they were all people that I knew uh, could be helpful in me developing something I didn't know everything about. Very cool. Okay, tell you what, we're gonna, let's get right into baseball. The All-Star Game is going to be coming up, and I was going to ask, do you think the ballots are fair? Okay, because now we're talking about Yasiel Puig. Um, you know, some people are saying, hey, it's too soon to allow him to be in the All-Star Game. But it is kind of for the fans, right? Well, I think, you know, I don't, Vernon, I'd be interested in how you feel about it because I think you and I both come from the same direction. as We both know it doesn't matter what we think because it's all about money and it's all about uh, ratings. It's all about entertainment now. It's not like the old days where, you know, you used to get excited about the Midsummer Classic. I don't get particularly excited about it, uh, but uh, to me, uh, the ballots are never going to be fair as long as you've got the fans because they're going to vote with their hearts rather than with their heads. Exactly. Yeah, it's first and foremost, it is a fans game, and Ron, you and I have been around long enough to remember when they had this thing twice a year. I don't know if the listeners realize that, but yeah, they, they used to have two All-Star games a year, and then finally, somebody in the front office said, hey, let's really make it mean something. Yeah. The winner will get home field advantage for the World Series. But uh, back to the point of this being a fan's game. That's just, it, it is what it is. It's an exhibition game, and uh, business being business, they're going to find a way to well, get Puig there, in there. There, there, there. There's always money in there because the uh, guys who won got paid more than the guys who lost. Right. So, you know, when you're talking millions of dollars that they get, if they get an extra, you know, 10, 20 grand, it's not that big a deal. But still, there's a little bit of pride, too. Even yeah, but Edward, you're missing the point on it. It has nothing to do with what the players are getting paid in the game, whether they win or lose. It's what sponsors will connect themselves to the balloting effort for the home run derby and all of that stuff. So that's where the big money oh, is. Oh, no, I get, I get you, Ron. I'm, I'm thinking about just from the standpoint of players, like, trying, you know, playing their hearts out. Uh, obviously, they don't want to get hurt. But they're playing hard because there's, there's a little bit of pride in there. Well, it's what they do. I mean, they're professionals. And so, yeah, you just line it out there. You roll the ball out there. Then they're just going to go in and, and, and play. But I think I think what, uh, what Ron was talking about, you know, getting those players in there and, and, and getting those sponsorships, uh, you know, kind of leaning forward with the, with the wallets in their hands. You know, you got to get those big names in those home run derbies and, and in the game itself. And... The, the trending guy in the game is Yasiel Puig. And so so they came up with that extra roster spot, and they've got him in there along with four other names, and that's how they're going to get Puig yeah, but in then there. you got the, the coaches who have to kind of face, you know, the rest of the players, and there's all the stuff behind the scenes. That well, the managers have to face the other managers because they're saying, well, what about my guy? Yeah, my guy's having yeah. a great year. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. But every year going. somebody's going to get screwed, huh, Ron? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. And, and you know, when you bring up Pugh, Pugh, uh, Pugh, uh about him, uh, you got to remember he's only been in the, the baseball, Major League Baseball for, you know, a short period of time. Is that an all-star? No. To me, I mean, well, he's I, an all-star I mean, this year. Judge him and call him an all-star. Has he had good performance? Yeah. But the pitchers don't know him yet. They haven't adjusted to him yet. And at some point, they, I mean, the other day against the uh, San Francisco Giants, what did he have? Over four. Uh, seven strikeouts in two games? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, if you look at, like, okay, how did he do in June? Now, remember, we're talking about the All-Star game, and theoretically, each year should stand on its own. So he has 44 hits, surpassing the 42 by Pittsburgh's Bob Elliott in September of 1939 for second most in the players' full, first full calendar months. And I totally agree with you that if the pitchers don't know him yet, you know, he, he probably does have an advantage. Yeah, but, the, you know, these veterans, these guys that have been around that have labored in the league for, for years. I mean, boy, look at, jeez, uh, 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 fe fella for the Giants, been in the majors for 10 years, finally gets in. Scudero. You know, again, it, it, veterans like that, you know, they want other veterans to get in who have been around who have really earned it instead of, you know, a guy that's been up for a couple months. Okay, let me go ahead and here. I want to finish off uh, our first segment with this kind of stuff that we were talking about with the All-Star Game. Okay, so uh, 
Do you, these are the biggest, quote, mistakes, and I was just looking online about this, all right, because we're talking about Puig. 2012, selecting second baseman Dan Ugla over Aaron Hill. Okay, now Ugla was hitting 221 with 12 home runs and 45 RBIs, but Hill was hitting 300 with 11 home runs and 40 RBIs. But you know what? That's going to happen every year, though. I exactly. mean, somebody with better numbers is going to get squeezed out. There's guys that get voted in that are on the disabled list. <laughs> I mean, Troy Dill, how, how does Troy Tulaleski get voted in? The fella might not even play. He's been hurt. Yeah, good point. Okay, 2013, right? Oakland, Oakland A's. Uh, All-star third baseman Ben Zobrist with 262 average, five home runs and 45 RBIs over Donaldson, who's hitting more than 50 points higher with 15 home runs and 57 RBIs. Yeah, I feel bad. You know what? The, and, and it's been said time and time again, the Oakland A's, that's the best team nobody knows. Yeah, and they just, they never get any respect. We're, anyway, we're going to cut to a commercial. But I, I will say this before, I let, not to jump in, and, 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 and Ron might back me up on this one. Here are the Oakland A's with that uh, $55 million, $60 million payroll, period, total, and they're putting in better numbers. They got, uh, well, there's only four teams with a better win-loss record than them. So it's Billy Bean and the Brain Trust laughing all the way to the bank, this being yeah. in the spirit okay. of Sport Econ 101. Okay, Ron, we're going to get it. Ron, uh, Ron, Ron, wait, Ron, Ron, hold on, hold on. You have to come to our break. When we come back, we're going to have you uh, chime in. Okay, the uh, theme is sports in the movies. Okay, first commercial break in the longest yard. What was the name of the, the original? The original one, and I think even the second one, too. What was the inmate's team name after stealing the guard's uniforms? Again, don't say until after we come back from break. The first we call with the correct answer went free three day, two nights paid for Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouse4fun.com. Call 888-660-4495 to answer this question. In the, long, the movie The Longest Charge, what was the name of the inmate's team after stealing the guard's uniform? So it really belonged to the guards. 888-660-4495. Make, sh make sure you include your name, email address. Speak slowly. Spell out your email one letter at a time. Don't touch that dial because Sports Econ 101 will be right back. Okay, that was good for a segment. Yeah. All right. Just, uh, I, I need to give me just a 30 seconds here. i got to save the file here. You having fun so far? Yeah, you don't want to lose the file. Yeah, don't lose the file. That's not, not good. <laughs> yeah. Hey Ron, in the early days when you did these shows and you did these interviews, were they were they recorded on carts? Were they recorded on tape? I mean, these are way in the days before files. Yeah, uh, I guess they were done on tape more than anything else. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, as far as I know, most of them I did live. Uh, well, uh, we did them on tape. Yeah, you did it. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you did, did it live, but 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 yeah. to, to archive the show, I didn't know whether they were on tape. Yeah, or, you were so smart to uh, save all those archives. Uh, yeah, because I got the last interview with Mickey Mantle before he died, Tom Landry before he died. Uh, you know, when Stan Mutual <coughs> passed away shortly ago, we had uh, that the, that night we played that interview. Uh, Steve Stable when he passed away. Uh, you know, I mean, we have just wow. Been very, yeah, we, we interviewed uh, Steve Sable in, uh, uh, on KNBR, and he was uh, he was fun. He what was what him. was Mickey Mantle like before he died? I mean, what, did, no, did he have uh, a sense that he was on his way out? Uh, well, the, the interview with Mantle was uh, when his book came out. And, uh, it was about two weeks before he passed away. Wow! And he was so good. Uh, you know, my uh, Vernon, you've heard me long enough to know what my interview style is. Well, I'll get into the X's and the O's. It, uh, you know, my first question was, you know, Mickey, you had such a great baseball career, but do you ever lament that if you had a different lifestyle, that that career might have been a little bit better? Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a, a fair question, and it was on. And he answered every one of them, and he told the story about how his uh, when he was struggling, all his dad, his dad said, "I'll be down there in two hours." And he said, "Why?" He said, "Because I didn't raise a coward, I mm. raised a man." There you go. Wow. Like that. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, hold on a second because we're going to uh, start the next segment, okay? Sure. All right. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn. We have in the studio on the phone, actually, uh, Ron Barr. And we went to the first commercial break. We asked this trivia question. In the movie The Longest Yard, what was the name of the inmate's team after stealing the guard's uniforms? I'm going with the green machine. You're close. Oh, 
Mean machine. Mean machine. The remember, mean machine. Yeah, remember mean That's machine. That's right. Mean That's right. Okay. Um, let's. I'm going to finish off just this quick all star thing, and then uh, uh, Ron, we were off break talking about your interview with Mickey Mantle. I thought that was kind of interesting. So let me just finish off a couple of quick things here. In 2009, all star third baseman Ryan Zimmerman was hitting 288, 14 home runs, and 52 RBIs, and he got picked over Pablo Sandoval, hitting 333 and 15 home runs and 55 RBIs. And then they said the worst one of all time was 2004 choosing first baseman Jason Giambi, who was hitting 241 with 11 home runs and 35 RBIs over Paul Canerco, who was hitting 296, 22 home runs and 59 RBIs. Giambi, he must have been the only A that year, where, 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 somebody, from, yeah, where somebody from every right. team had to get in. Yeah, the nemesis is that every team has to be represented. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> there must have been a pretty bad team to have to choose that. Well, I, I, it's, hey, that's just hey, that's the system. Hey, hey, yeah. going back, Ron. Yeah, we were talking off. Uh, I, I was going to say off camera. Uh -huh. We were talking during the commercial break. Just, just give the folks listening just a, the laundry list of, of of the A listers that you interviewed. Unfortunately, before they they checked out. Well, certainly Mickey Mantle was on that list, and, and it was memorable as well. And then Tom Landry was another. And I remember one of the questions I asked Tom. I said, Tom, in that first year after you retired, how strange was it to you to be able to see the leaves turn in the fall? And he said, you know, you're absolutely right. He said, I rarely got out of my office very much. And I couldn't tell you which season was which season, which just shows you, you know, how buried and focused those people are. And then uh, Stan Musial was another one that comes to mind. Steve Sable is another one that comes to mind. I mean, there have been so many people that over the years, and then, you know, people like Chris Schinkel in our business. And then I've, I've put together what I'm proud of in our, our audio vault library of 12,000 interviews. I have the largest collection of Negro League baseball players. And, you know, somebody like a Peanut Johnson, and I'm sure you don't know who Peanut Johnson is, but Peanut Johnson was only 5'6", and she was one of only a, a three or four female players in the old Negro Leagues, and she was a pitcher, and she was a damn good pitcher, too, by the way. Not a knuckleballer. Yeah, and so we have to, you know, we have all of those in the library, and they're, they're things that as we move on in life and we lose some of these people, people will be able to go back and listen to them talk about their careers and about their lives and what it was like, uh, you know, growing up during some difficult times in this country uh, when it came to race relations and everything. Uh, I know Bud Cat Grant told me a great story one time. Uh, I asked him, I said, you know, baseball has been so important to the African-American community. I said, you know, you grew up in the South, and I remember driving to the Miami International Airport from my mom's house, and along the freeway I saw a church out in the middle of a field. And I said, I noticed in the back of that church there was a, uh, a baseball diamond. And I said, it was at the church, obviously, and I saw... Uh, men with their coats off, white shirts on, uh, sleeves rolled up, and they were playing baseball. I said, how important was baseball to the, to the black community and, and, and black families? And he talked about it with such great passion about how important it was and, and why it was a life-sustaining experience for, for many African Americans. And those are, those are things that you don't get a chance to hear mostly in sports interviews. Yeah, just getting back to Mickey Mantle for a second, uh, just... Just thinking, we, everybody knows about his off-field, uh, I guess, uh, frivolity. <laughs> but 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 think, if he had not tripped over yeah. that sprinkler yeah. in center field, like, what kind of ball it, player, how long or his career might have been? Wasn't it his second year? Like, yeah, but right early on in his know? career. I mean, the guy was just, it was like, it was like, it was like Mike, Mike Trout today. Remember how Mike Trout just kind of yeah, yeah. burst on the scene? I mean, he was just, the guy could do everything. And then all the, man, he trips over the sprinkler, right, Ron? And then... Yeah. Just, just tore up that knee, knee, and just wasn't the same. Because he was extremely fast. Yeah. Very fast player. Yeah, and but, you know, I mean, he, he certainly, that was young enough. He was young enough where maybe, uh, and, of course, we don't have the medical techniques that we have uh, today. Uh, but you you think about the, the drinking and the carousing and everything else. And he was very candid about saying that, he said, you know, what happened to me was self-induced. Uh, and he said, I wish I had it to do over again. He said, but since I can't. I want people to hear the message so that they won't make the same mistakes that I did. I got a great story to tell you about Mickey Mantle, but I can't. I, I, I can't do it on the air. <laughs> I can't. Off air. Okay, you, you know what's interesting though? You, you were just talking about uh, Mickey and tripping over and all mm -hmm. that. And it just reminded me because this is one of the things I wanted to, to uh, bring up here: comparison of baseball fields 
uh, making home runs easier in some parts, unlike the polo grounds, you know, well, of course, for right field, there's only, what, 250 feet or something, which, by the way, uh, uh, I just heard a statistic that Mel Ott, you know, he had 511 home runs, right? He hit something like 390 of them at home and only 100 and, you know, whatever away, mostly because of that wow. right field porch. Hey, there's, there's a jersey that's retired in the annals of uh, Giants baseball. Yeah, yeah. And it's got to be. I don't know how good a fielder he was, but you know, 511 home runs is a lot. <laughs> Nothing to sneeze. And did it clean? Yeah. Yeah, I think you both. Uh, Denny McLean, did you say, uh, Vern? No, he no. said he, he did it clean. Oh, he did. He, he, no, 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 Millot, he did it clean. 511, and he did it all clean. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I think we all lament is the fact that you don't have players telling stories like they used to. Um, and it's, it's really, really too bad uh, because I remember one of my favorite stories was what Duke Snyder told me about, uh, you know, where the Dodgers played back in Brooklyn. He said, you know, they had outfield uh, advertisements and he said there was a company that made suits. Oh, hit sign, win suit? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing They always placed the outfielder right in front of the, the side, so nobody ever got a free <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I, think, I think the great Gino Simoli was a right fielder for Brooklyn, uh, who, who later drove a UPS truck. Yep. He had, his, his, his route was in San Francisco. Yep. He'd, do, he'd do his route, and he'd have a cigar in his mouth, and play a gin rummy at the, uh, at the Italian Athletic Club in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, look at this, this uh, polo ground thing, 505 feet. I mean, the famous, you know, Willie Mays catch. Right. Um, caught it, uh, what, probably what was, was within, what, 20 feet of the fence? Of the one, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that thing was and that, and that, and that was And that, that was the first kind of catch of its kind. That's why it was so, That's like, true. oh, my God, look look at this. Yeah, now guys make over-the-shoulder catches a lot. Yeah, yeah, and, and just, you know, spectacular. Uh, yeah. You know, I still remember Ron Swoboda in 1969 in the World Series, just being horizontal. Yeah. Fantastic. And then, you know, of course, the World Series, and then, you know, what happens after the play. That's the big thing about Mays, was that he got the ball quickly back to the infield. Mm -hmm. from that. Well, Mays told me a great story about the fact that uh, when they were all in New York, the Dodgers, the Yankees, and, and the Giants, he said that when he was a rookie and he came up, he was uh, living in a boarding house, and it was right next door to a little store, and he said uh, every time they played the Dodgers, the Giants played the Dodgers, would come home and there'd be a lot of people out in front of the stoop and in front of the store and he'd go up the inside to his room he'd look outside they'd be gone didn't understand it every time it was the night before the game so he tells the story in the, in the clubhouse and the guys start laughing and they said don't you know what that is and he said no he said that's all the people that are betting on the game tomorrow they wanted to know what time willie mays got in oh that's funny uh, uh. <laughs> yeah my dad used to tell me about uh my dad uh, grew up in Brooklyn, and he kept saying about how, his, one of his favorite players was uh, Ted Williams, and of course it was like, you know, Ted should have played uh, in, in Yankee Stadium, right, and Joe DiMaggio should have played in at Fenway mm -hmm. because of, of the fortune, you know, if you wonder how many more home runs each one of them would have hit. Well, uh, I will tell you about Ted Williams because I was a very young sportscaster in Washington, D.C., when Ted Williams was the manager of the Washington Senators. Oh, but yeah. you know what, Ron? A first baseball game I ever saw in my life, it was Twins at the Senators. This had to have been 68 or 9, yeah. and Ted Williams was the manager. Yeah, and you remember where that was, RFK? RFK Stadium. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. exactly. So I'm about 19, maybe 20 years old, and, you know, Ted had the reputation of not liking the media. And so I'm sitting on the bench. Nobody else is there in the dugout. Ted comes in, sits down, and I look down, and I want to interview him, but, you know, it was a little bit intimidating. And so I slid down and got next to him, and he looked at me like, what the hell do you want? <laughs> and I said, you know, I got a question for you, Ted. I said, how good is the bone fishing down in Florida? Well, you would have thought I said the magic words, because, you know, he used to do the American sportsman. Right. He was scouting, and bone fishing, he was a great fisherman. And so he looked at me, he started talking about the fish. We spent 20, 30 minutes talking bone fishing. And every time after that, he saw me, whether it was baseball or anything else, he gave me all the time I wanted. See, you, def you, 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 you diffuse the bomb right away. <laughs> all about 20 minutes, that's probably more than he gave the media in 25 yeah, years. Yeah, of life. Although I wonder which manager was more intimidating, Ted Williams or Frank Robinson? 
Well, Frank, Frank, you know, you're right about that. That's a very good point, Vernon, because uh, Frank Robinson was a guy, and we've all known this, Reggie Jackson is the same type of guy. They will challenge you to see if you're worth their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. and, and Frank was that way. I mean, he. I remember with Reggie, uh, and I treated Frank the same way when he was the manager with the Giants, that, you know, I would stay there, and he knew I was going to be a bulldog. But with Reggie, he promised me an interview. Uh, I think he was with the Angels at that time, and he stayed out on the field longer than he should have. And he comes off, he says, you got five minutes. And I said, Reggie, I've been waiting longer than that, and you're going to give me longer there than that. There you go. Okay, hey, hold on to that thought, Ron. we got to cut to another commercial break here. Uh, the, here's our second trivia question. Again, the movie is sports. That's good. The theme is sports in the movies. Robert, this is an easy one. Robert De Niro played Jake LaMotta in what boxing film? The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Again, their website is lighthouse4fun.com. Call 888-660-4495 to answer this question. And no looking it up on the Internet. I think Vern, Vern I can see the smoke coming out. He, he knows the answer to this one. Robert De Niro played Jake LaMotta in what boxing film? Again, call 888-660-4495. Make sure to include your name, email address, speak slowly, spell out your email one letter at a time. Don't touch that dial because Sports Econ 101 will be right back. Excellent. This time goes very quickly. Oh, yeah. Great sports movie, by the way. Yeah. Ron, you know that one. That's an easy one. Uh, is it somebody up there who loves me or likes me? Or no, 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 no. That was Paul Newman. That was Paul Newman, yeah. This is, uh, um, this is Raging Bull. You get older, you don't remember yeah. it quickly. Yeah. Uh, at least I don't. <laughs> uh, the next question is going to be harder. Uh, okay. I'll be surprised. I'll stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for that one, yeah. I happen to see the movie, but uh, if you didn't see the movie... Uh, hey, Ron, did you see uh, Did you see 42? Yeah, Raging Bull is, is uh, the model one. Yes. Did you did you see Forty Two? Uh, you're sending it to me, uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. I haven't seen it yet. You know, I, I, I kind of enjoyed it. It was it was okay. It wasn't great. Did you see it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was good. He did, he did a very nice job. But he did really did. Well, it's it's at, to to your point. I mean, more more than like being being dazzled at this major, like like sookly produced, you know, movie. Yeah. It, it, it told a nice. Story. I mean, it could have easily have been That's on an, an A and E movie, something like yeah, that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I no, they did a good job of telling the I story. They did, yeah, they did a real good job. Well, for kind of funny, I had the guy that was the stand-in for the actor uh, who played Robinson uh, who did all the baseball scenes and the uh, the thing, and it was interesting to get his perspective on 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 what it was like to do the movie. It was, it was mm. different. Interesting. Okay. Um, Okay, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn. And on the phone, we have Ron Barr. When we cut to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question. Robert De Niro played Jake LaMotta in what boxing film? Vern, you know that one? Raging Bull. Raging Bull. Good movie. Enjoyed that. Okay. Uh, One other quick thing about uh, Major League Baseball, because it reminded me uh, with... Uh, Yasiel Puig is it, what about these guys who are playing well and decide they want to renegotiate their contract? What do you feel about that? Well, I, mean, I think it's more too young to do that. But. I, I think it's more of their agent talk than anything else. I mean, the agent's job is to squeeze every penny he can out of uh, out of an organization. Yeah, but so when you sign a contract, though, I know, I know, I know. It just, but it it just happens every year. You know, somebody usually usually. Usually the player's in a contract year, right, Barr? Usually it's it's, it's one of those deals that when he, when he wants to go ahead and renegotiate. You got to remember that that really doesn't come into play that much in baseball because they can't they don't have any leverage to be able to jump teams or go anywhere else, and it's really up to the team. I mean, if you take a look at some talented players that have been young, you don't hear them asking for for more money. They'll ask for an extension, or the club will realize that they're talented and they'll try to buy out the years. For our arbitration years so that they have them under contract until they become free agents. So you really don't hear that from young players in baseball very much at all. Okay. You know, I was just reading a book by uh, on the life of uh, Vernon Lefty Gomez, who uh, who has you know Bay Area roots here, and I am just amazed. Now these are the New York Yankees, Edward. I mean, this is like twenties and thirties, but how year after year, like the stars of the team would have to really 
walk into the office and kind of plead their case just to get a raise for a few extra dollars. Yeah. And we're talking about salaries that's pretty much tip money to the clubhouse guy today. Well, you go back to uh, the early 20s with the antitrust, you know, the um, entity exemption. And in fact, that brings me to my next point here is that the A's, uh, you know, they've been wanting to move and uh, they, they're testing the, uh, you know, the, what do they call it, the, re not the reserve clause. Is that the re what they call it, the reserve clause? Because in 19, here it goes, 1915, the federal league, they were trying to, um, they sued MLB. And in 1922, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote that uh, baseball is a personal effort, not subject to antitrust. And that's basically what kind of solidified so far, because it, it, it hasn't really been, it's been kind of tested a little bit, right? But um, you've got Major League Baseball against, uh, you know, they've got San Jose trying to get the A's. And the San Jose, Fremont before that, trying to get them. And I mean, they, it's, it's, the it's, it's clear it's clear that the owner wants to move that team. Exactly. And then they have here, okay, so the lawsuit was filed and it's challenging the Giants' territorial rights to San Jose under baseball's antitrust exemption. That's what they call and it. San Jose originally, originally was uh, held by the rights for the Oakland A's, the Haas family. And then he just oh. gave it to the Giants and, and, it's, and it's been Giants' territory ever since. Uh, did he uh, sell it to them? Yeah, I, oh, he must have sold it to them. Yeah, but not for, but not for, not not for big dollars. No. Yeah, what's really stupid about it all is that the Giants have their fans, the A's have their fans, yeah. and and the Giants, if they, it, it should come down to be if you compete, compete on the field, you're always going to have people that want to come out and watch the product. If you don't, um, you know, you're supposed to get a pass on that. I'm sorry, I don't believe in that anyway. So uh, if you take a look at the uh, the New York. Giants and also the New York Jets. They both play in New Jersey. I mean, so <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's a little bit senseless. We got to come into into the 2000s uh, with the idea on this, and, and hopefully they'll get this thing resolved. But you can, you're not going to get it with Bud Selig as the commissioner. That's for damn sure. Well, the Giants, they don't even want the Giants don't want the Golden State Warriors to move to San Francisco. Exactly. I mean, it's right in their backyard. The Giants don't even want it. Yeah, and the reason for that, I'll give you some insight on it because I have a little bit of inside information on this thing is that they wanted the Warriors to jump into an arena that they were going to build on their parking lot right. the corner uh, to the baseball stadium, and they wanted to have them under their thumb. Well, I'm sorry, when you have Peter Goober, who is a master entertainer, and also Joe Lake, who has the money, they are not about it to become a, a subservient tenant uh, to the San Francisco Giants on that sort of thing. Uh, and I was talking to a friend of mine who's with the team, and he said they checked the, what, and, you know, the overlap. And he said when it came to any scheduling as far as ball games uh, for the two teams, it was only less than five. So it's not, you know, like traffic will be a major problem. Right. I said to him, well, what about the, if you happen to have, uh, you know, the circus in town or an ice show or something else? He said, yeah, uh, to some degree. He said, but it would not be a major major problem. But to think about it, Rod, boy, if they get that thing built right next to the bridge and they have it looking like the Opera Plaza that, that's in Sydney, Australia, wow, what a what a jewel that's going to be. But, yeah, it but is. It is. It is. And, and, and I wonder I wonder if it would make AT&T Park all of a sudden look small. Sure. Yeah, well, I don't think so. Uh, it's not so much as, as the smallness of it. I mean, it's a baseball stadium, first and foremost. That's why the Craft Bowl is moving down to the new Levi Stadium down in Santa, uh, down in Santa Clara. Uh, I mean, it is what it is, and it's always going to be a draw as long as you're putting a good product on the field. So when did the Oakland Coliseum, you know, because they have both basketball and baseball right, right there, uh, is that the same sort of issue they were kind of sharing? You know what I mean? Well, the, well, the stadium for, was for the outdoor venues, and then the arena house the Warriors and they have the, the, the contours that wouldn't be so big they'd have to move it to the stadium but now when 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 the Warriors come to San Francisco and they want to do it in 2017 they're gonna have that brand spanking new arena and they want these and that and, and that will pull the attractions away from Oakland and into San Francisco yeah how, how many uh, seats do you think it'll hold so like 25,000 I don't I don't know if it'll be Didn't that many. Play at the Cal Palace? Where, where, well, where they, well, the San Francisco well, 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 Ron can go back to that one. I mean, Cal Palace had everything. Yeah, they used to run cattle shows through there. Look, the answer to the thing, if it was a perfect, and, you know, I know we're, we've got a national audience here, 
and I don't want to bore them to death, but I, mean, I think every city in the in the country is dealing with this, especially if they're a major city with multiple pro teams in here. But if in the San Francisco Bay Area, if they force the or if they can find an accommodation for the Raiders to play down in the new stadium in Santa Clara, tear down uh, the arena when the Warriors move over to San Francisco, and then build the Oakland A's uh, a first-class stadium there, uh, because you've got Bard already in there, you've got a freeway system already in there. Yep. You're gonna draw people if you give them a good stadium. Yeah, you gotta put a lot of bombs. Build it, and they will we, come. Exactly. Okay, but anyway, since we do have a national audience, let's move on to something else here. Uh, 31 cars failed inspection for illegal roof flaps at Daytona practice. Ooh, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now isn't this just like sort of like steroids in baseball? I mean, you get some illegal edge. And well, then, one of them was my 1990 Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the funny thing is that, okay, so they get caught, and it's like, okay, but, you know, what, so what's the penalty? Well, there's, they were apparently still allowed to participate. I mean, it's cheating in sports. So 30, 31 cars? 31 cars. Now, 31 wondering... cars. And, you, and, what's, and what's a field? What, maybe 40 cars in a field? <laughs> so I'm thinking it, it's all about money, again, as it always is, where it's like, how can they just say, okay, you guys have to go home? <laughs> We're just going to have nine now, cars. Let me, let me right. just say this about, about NASCAR and when it comes to the cheating. Yeah, there are some things that probably uh, go beyond. But when you're talking about technology, you're talking about an evolving technology. You're talking about bending the rules to some degree, and you're talking about maybe a, a bolt that's a quarter of an inch larger than what it should be. Uh, well, in, in well, this I case, hey, Ron, in this case, it was the roof flaps spacers. Yeah, that it, the roof flaps. yeah, illegally machined down to reduce weight. And that reminded me, when I used to bowl semi-professionally, when I went to tournaments, Believe it or not, there was cheating there too. In what? Fact, yes, bowling? Classes. Get out of here! I'll tell you what. Don't the, you just aim for the arrows? No, no. Before that, what oh, they would okay. do is you'd have to get your ball weighed, make sure that it's not over 16 pounds. That's the limit. But then they would also test for hardness because what never had, had that problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you do is it, generally they like to oil the lanes, and you want to get as much uh, hook as possible. So you want a ball that's really soft. Guys used to dip their ball in acetone. And make it a really soft ball so that it would grab lane. Wow. Illegal. Okay. Other guys would put it in uh, the refrigerator in the morning to harden it up so that when they tested it for hardness, it would, it would pass. Just and couldn't it, give it some Viagra, huh? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had a hard ball, not balls, if you had a hard ball, I mean, or excuse me, if you had a cold one, uh -huh. they would literally say, you have to wait an hour before we test it again. So, and, you know, here's what I'm thinking about is that, wow. you know, with all this cheating going on, in, a, in effect, is it good for sports? Let's say the steroids, because you're getting a lot of home runs. People like Let me to turn it around on you. What, what sport, if any, do you guys think in which there is no cheating? Uh, boxing. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, badminton. Curling. Curling. I don't know. There you go. No, 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 no. Not badminton. You're wrong there. Remember what happened in the Olympics where they. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. They were throwing games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. I forgot about that. Gee, the one thing we we picked up on, okay, yeah, curling. Um, I guess volleyball. I haven't. I had so far. I, I have yet to. Of course, if you throw games, you can do it in any sport. You could. Right? Yeah, that that's kind of. Uh, <laughs> that's fun. Um, okay. Oh, uh, what other thing here? What do I want to? Oh yeah, Celtics hire Brad, a coach, Brad Stevens from mm -hmm. Butler, and he's going from college to NBA. That surprised me. How about you, Ron? Uh, it surprised me a little bit, and I don't know what uh, they were thinking about or what they saw in him, but, uh, I mean, I'm sure that I'm not saying it happened at his program in college, but you, Vernon, you and I both know, as the old line is, is that some of the college basketball players take a, a pay cut and they go to the program. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody could. Well, I was wondering how, what's the probability that a coach can go from the NBA to college and then back to the NBA? Now look at Rick Pitino. Rick Pitino did. Yeah. 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 Sure, he did. He went. Uh, he went from college to the Pro, NBA back to college. Back to college. Yeah, but he. But he's. But, but I'm he's, saying from NBA to college and then back to the NBA. Well, Larry Brown, right? He did. He he okay, he, okay. he boy he jumped back a bunch of times. Yeah. All right. So okay, it does happen. I like that. Um, yeah, it's, is it common? No. Does it happen? Yes, it, yeah. can, it can happen. Well, he said you know, he was probably the right hire if you think that the guy is a young, uh, good, solid coach because 
after the deals that they made um, and they got rid of the veteran players, they're in a rebuilding mode anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you may as well go with somebody who, if you will, uh, ascertain he's a strong coach, bring him in, put some young players around him, see what he can do. He's only 36 years old, and he'll be the uh, Celtics' first head coach in 63 years with no NBA experience. That smells uh, like a that that smells like 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 a three-year plan. All right. I, I, no, you're right about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. We are going to cut to our third and final. Oh, goody! Tough question coming up. Yeah. Here's here's, All a, right. here's a tough question for you. Okay. Who played the role of Jack Jefferson? a boxer resembling early 20th century Jack Johnson, remember him? Mm -hmm. okay. In the movie Great White Oak. The first three callers with the correct answer. Ooh, I see him stump on this one. Okay. Wait a minute, wait, 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 I, I, I got I to read it again for the break. read it again, okay, friends, let me just tell. First three callers with the correct answer, win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouse4fun.com. Call 888-660-4495 to answer this question. Who played the role of Jack Jefferson, a boxer resembling early 20th century Jack Johnson? I mean, you can almost just substitute the two. It, it really was that close. In the movie, Great White Hope. Make sure to include your name. Your I got name. a good guess. Okay, you can make sure to include your name, email address, speak slowly, spell out your email one letter at a time. Now, by the way, Ron, do you know any answer to this one? Nope. Okay. I, I'm sure you will have heard of the actor, though. That, that's a for sure. Okay, don't touch that dial because Sports Econ 101 will be right back. I think I know. I think I know. Okay. Well, right. without, without looking down. Yeah, no, yeah, no, uh, no cheating here. Where is the White House Resort? Uh, it's between Rio Vista and Stockton. It's in the Delta Loop. Now, here's a secret. Nobody knows. You can't repeat this, but I own it. That's why I can get the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, nine, six, and we have, we just have a very short segment, and then we're done. Okay, so let's see if we can answer this question here. And we'll see about any last minute closing comments, because yeah, this one's only two minutes and thirty seconds. Darren gave me the uh, two thirty in the show. Uh, two minutes and thirty seconds. Okay, wow. all right. Well, well, listen, when you come back, why don't you kiss me off, and then you two guys can fill it out. That way, it, it won't. Uh, you can control the time on the out. Okay. You're, okay. I'll, I'll just give you my quick thoughts for the day because they're kind of funny here. Uh, okay. Okay. Ready? I, I always end them with uh, you know a little funny thoughts for the day. So, my uh, one time, my wife had a suspicion that I had been cheating on her. So I said, "Don't worry, I'm not interested in disappointing another woman." Mm. And uh, do you realize, now this one's kind of silly. Do you realize if Venetian blinds hadn't been invented, it would have been curtains for all of us? Uh, <laughs> That's a little uh, too And silly. you're here all week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. Um, all right, uh, Ron, uh, so we'll, we'll ask you for like one last minute uh, quick story, and then uh, we'll say goodbye to you. Uh, and away. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn, my co-host, and we're on the uh, phone with Ron Barr. Uh, okay, Vern, you said you know the answer to this question. I, I think, think you know I answer. think I might know. Okay, who played the role of Jack Jefferson, a boxer resembling early 20th century Jack Johnson in the movie Great White Hope? Who is my that? guess is, gosh, Come on. is it Michael Duncan Kennedy? No, it was James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he did. He did That's a very, right. He did a very good job. It's like an older movie, too. Um, he was so, great in Field of Dreams, yeah. among other things. Yeah, he, absolutely. Well, I love that boy. Uh, Ron, before we say goodbye to you, any last uh, comments? Well, no, it's just that I hope that fans will tend to be a little more tolerant when they evaluate athletes, really. As I've said many times, uh, there are very few jobs in which if you have a bad day at the office, read about it the next day in the newspaper or hear it and see it on radio and television and if you have a bad day at the office uh, very few of us uh, when we go back into our office get booed <laughs> so I hope that uh, fans will look at the bigger picture and enjoy sports for what it is because I get real concerned uh, when I see uh, the trickle down effect uh, sometimes and how athletes I was up in a softball game in Montana and there was a kid that just got really upset because things didn't go his way. And I was talking with his dad, and he said, he's on a select team. And he said, 
Ron, he said, all of these kids are this way. He said, uh, they're traveling all over the country. And so my only message is, is that it is still a game and, and always keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you very much. Well said. And uh, here's our thoughts for the day. One time my wife had a suspicion that I might be cheating on her. So I said, don't worry. I'm not interested in disappointing another woman. Yeah, she appreciated that. And uh, do you realize that if Venetian blinds hadn't been invented, it would have been curtains for all of us. Okay, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101, where we're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and giving away vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, your host. We'll see you next week. So long. Ron, thank you very much for being our guest. My pleasure. Vernon, take care, partner, and 